Today I want to share with you how to make salt rising bread. This is a very old fashioned recipe and it's quite unique. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient dense foods like bone broth, ferments, sourdough and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Well, I learned about this very unique recipe for making bread from my father-in-law and he was raised in the mountains of West Virginia. And he would share with me how his great grandmother made this bread, his grandmother made this bread, his aunt made this bread. Pretty much everybody in his family made this bread and everyone was raised eating this bread. Well, my father-in-law was very dear to me and he really was a second father to me. But unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago and we miss him terribly. But I want to recreate this recipe for you to honor his memory. And also in honoring his memory, I want to keep alive this recipe from the mountains of West Virginia. And I'll also be sharing other recipes uh, from my husband's family in the future. But I want to keep this recipe alive uh, because it's very regional to that area of our country here in the United States. And it's somewhat of a recipe that's becoming somewhat lost. And I really don't want to see that happen. I feel it's so important for us to preserve these traditional recipes and these traditional ways of making different foods. And in this case, a, a very specific bread and one that's also very delicious. So the first thing that we need to do to make this bread is to make a starter. But it's a very unusual starter and it can be done in a couple of different ways. You can start it with some cornmeal, which I'll talk about in a minute, or you can start it with a potato. And unlike sourdough uh, or a sourdough starter, which really focuses on the yeast, this type of starter really focuses on the bacteria. So in sourdough, where the yeast is the star of the show, or the natural yeast that creates your sourdough starter is the star of the show and helps rise your bread. In this bread, in salt rising bread, it's the bacteria that helps rise the bread. So how do we get a starter going where we encourage the bacteria to proliferate and the yeast to be less so. And how we do that is once we make these starters is we need to keep them warm. And by warm, I mean somewhere between about 105 and 110 degrees. And the wonderful pioneer women of my father-in-law's family knew exactly where on their wood stove that perfect temperature would be. So what do us modern cooks have to do? Well, I have a solution for that. I have found that by putting this starter in my electric oven with the heat off, but the pilot light on will give me just about that correct temperature. Well, let's start making our first starter and I'm going to make this with a potato. And basically I just get an Idaho potato, I give it a good wash and then I start to cut it up and put it into the jar. Now I'm, I had a very big potato and I've already got one starter going. And so I'm just going to use the other half of this potato because it's more than enough. You just want to put about a, a half jars full of potato. And there's nothing fancy. You just slice up your potato and put it right into your jar. Now you may, may be wondering, where did this bread get its name, Salt Rising? Is there a lot of salt in it? And actually, no. We put in a little tiny bit of salt that helps to kind of tamp down the yeast and encourage the bacteria, uh, very much like when we make a ferment. But it's not the salt that researchers believe, historians, food historians believe, is how the starter or the bread got its name. But they believe that possibly in order to maintain the proper temperature before these pioneer women focused on their using their wood stove and whatnot or in place of their wood stove, that they would get rock salt, heat it up, and then they would take their starter in their jar or their bowl, whatever way they were making it, and submerge it in partially into the rock salt. And then the rock salt kept it at the right temperature. So that's one theory for how this bread got its name. 
But this was very popular in the mountains, as I said, of West Virginia, and also in parts of Pennsylvania. Uh, sort of basically, it kind of ran in popularity amongst part of the Appalachian area. Now, the next thing that you want to do is just take two tablespoons of sugar and pour this over your potatoes. That's two tablespoons. And I'm just using an organic white cane sugar. And next, you want to get a heaping teaspoon of baking soda. And go ahead and add that right in. And a quarter teaspoon of salt. That's all the salt. <laughs> well, it seems kind of funny, but as I shared, that uh, the salt uh, really isn't where, uh, where the bread got its name. And the next thing you want to do is add three tablespoons of all-purpose flour. And this is just a plain, organic, all-purpose flour. You can use whatever you have on hand. And that's three tablespoons. Once you get all of that in there with the potatoes, you just want to boil some water in a tea kettle, and then you just want to add enough water to cover the potatoes. And then I like to just take a clean tooth, uh, toothpick, a tea, clean chopstick, and just get in here. You can use a knife or a fork, you know, a spoon, whatever you have. And I just like to give it a little help along stirring up all of the flour and the dry ingredients. But you don't have to get it perfect. I just like to give it a little stir to help it along. And then I can see too if I need a little extra water to just top this off to make sure the potatoes are completely submerged. And I'm just gonna top this off with a little more boiling water and we're all set. Now the next thing you wanna do is take some plastic wrap and just put this over the top of your jar and you can see, you know, if it doesn't stick, you can even put a little rubber band or something, but you just want to put that plastic wrap over there. And then you just want to take a knife and you just want to make a small slit in the top, just so that bacteria can breathe. Now, as we discussed earlier, you want to put this in that warm place where this will maintain a temperature for the next eight, about eight to 12 hours. It really depends. You, it may froth up within eight hours, it may take 10, may even take 12 hours. But you just want to put this in that warm place where it can stay somewhere between about 105 and 110. It's not perfectly exact science, but some people say 104, which I think is cute. But you want to keep it somewhere in that temperature to really help that good bacteria to proliferate. Now, if you find that your electric oven with the light on or your gas oven with the pilot light on or whatever the case may be isn't quite warm enough or it's too warm or whatever, there are other options. You can try putting some water in a crock pot or a slow cooker and put the uh, jar in there and use a little thermometer to see if, uh, it, you know, put the slow cooker on the lowest setting and then test it with a thermometer to see what the temperature is. Uh, some people will put uh, about a third or a half of water in their slow cooker and then put the lid on, but inverted. And so it makes like a little basin. And then you put your jar just on top of that. That may rise enough warmth to keep it warm. You may even need to put a dish towel uh, underneath it or a pot holder or something like that. So there are different options that you can experiment with. And some folks have even found, I don't have one of these, but if you have one of those electric bread proofing ovens that you can set to an exact temperature of like 104 degrees Fahrenheit or 105, and that those are Fahrenheit temperatures that I'm giving, uh, I've heard that that works beautifully. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and put this into my uh, oven that's been turned off but has the electric light on. And then I'm gonna show you how to make an, another version of a salt rising bread starter. Now the next salt rising bread starter can be made with cornmeal. And there are different schools of thought as to whether you, whether you need germinated cornmeal, you know, the stone ground cornmeal that still has the germ, or ungerminated cornmeal, which has the germ removed. And apparently both will work. So whether you swear by one or the other, it doesn't seem to really make a difference. They both seem to create a nice effervescent uh, fermentation to go on to be used to make the bread. Today I'm just gonna use this stone ground cornmeal. This does contain the germ. 
uh, it is germinated. Uh, it's easy to get here in Texas. I get this right at my grocery store. But as I said, you know, I understand from my husband's side of the family, my husband's cousins, and uh, from my father-in-law, that any uh, cornmeal will work for this. So these are degerminated, and uh, I gather that uh, my husband's family has used something like this for years, and it's worked just fine. And this is degerminated, just right at the grocery store. And this is another brand that again is degerminated. So either one, anything that you want to pick should work great. So we're going to use two tablespoons of the cornmeal, and then we're going to follow this up with ingredients very similar to what we did with the potatoes. To this, we're just going to add a quarter teaspoon of the baking soda and a quarter teaspoon of the salt. And I'm just using plain old salt here. That's what works best for this. And then we're just going to go ahead and add a tablespoon of the flour. And the next thing we're going to add to this is one cup of scalded milk. Now, scalded milk basically means to bring it up to a temperature where you start to see all little bubbles forming along the uh, circumference of the, of the pan that you're warming your milk in. Now, I don't know if it really matters if it's been pasteurized and homogenized and so on and so forth, but the recipe says that the milk must be scalded, so I'm not going to take any chances. I always scald the milk. Well, I scalded the milk, and I'll take a picture and I'll overlay it for those of you who are new to this technique. But basically what you're looking for is just this little bit of bubbles and foam that occur around the uh, circumference of the pan that you're warming your milk in. So hopefully with an up-close picture you can see what I'm talking about. And I want to mention, if you have made salt rising bread, or maybe you grew up in that part of the country in the West Virginia or Pennsylvania border area, in the Appalachian Mountains area, uh, let me know in the comments below. And I'd love to hear if, you, if you've if you eaten this bread and made this bread or people in your family made this bread. It would be wonderful. And also let me know if you'd like to see more uh, uh, West Virginia recipes, uh, recipes from the mountains of West Virginia that my father-in-law and uh, grew up eating. Now I'm just going to go ahead and whoops, a little messy, <laughs> and pour in that scalded milk. And then I'm just going to take my fork here and just give this a good stir. And then next all you need to do is the same thing we did with the potato starter. We're just going to put some plastic wrap over this and then we're just going to poke a hole to let the bacteria breathe. And now we're going to find that nice warm place. In my case, it's the electric oven with the light on. And let this rest in there and stay nice and warm for the next 8 to 12 hours. Well, these are two starters that I had resting in my oven. And so you can see exactly what happened. Here is the one that was made with cornmeal. Now this is a smaller amount of starter than what you're going to get with the potato starter, but they're both going to work great. Now I, I need to give you some heads up about what to expect with these because they're going to have a very strong aroma. People will sometimes describe it as like a very uh, strong um, cheesy type aroma. And this is what's interesting about this, is the final product, the bread, uh, has somewhat of a cheesy flavor to it, which is what makes it so tasty, and yet there's no cheese in it. But the, the aroma can be quite strong. Sometimes people may describe it as stinky cheese. <laughs> but I promise you the bread will be delicious. And here is the potato starter, and this is really, this is really foamy. Oof, that is some aroma. Uh, so I'm gonna, what I'll do is I'll take uh, pictures uh, overhead of both of these so you can see what to expect and again uh, anticipate a, a rather strong aroma. And I'll overlay a picture of the cornmeal starter so you can see what that looks like. I'll do something up, you know, I'll take an overhead shot and uh, overlay that so you can see that up close. And I'll do the same here with the potato water. I can't 
or the potato water starter. <laughs> I can't tilt it too much, but I'll take an overhead shot so that you can see how bubbly and foamy that is as well. And they're both warm. And the next step, what we're gonna do now is, and today I'm, I'll make the bread uh, with this potato starter. And then another day I'll make another video where I use the cornmeal starter. Uh, but as I said, both work great, both make basically very similar breads. Next what we're going to do is take our starter, our potato water starter here, and we're just going to go ahead and pour out all of the uh, liquid that's in here, but we're going to leave behind the potatoes. So I've got that starter in there, and then to that I'm going to add one cup of warm water. and. Apparently, depending on how many cups of water you add, determines how many loaves of bread you're going to make. But again, I don't know if that's an exact science. What we're gonna do at this point is we're gonna start adding in flour, and you may need anywhere from two to four cups of flour, and we're gonna just add it in until we get uh, what looks like a nice, uh, like a, What's it called? Pancake batter. You want it to look like pancake batter. So I'm going to go ahead and add in some flour and then just give it a mix and see if we can get it to that pancake batter consistency. So that took about two and a half cups of flour to get it to kind of a nice, kind of loose pancake batter. And what I'm going to do now is just cover this uh, loosely, uh, just with a dish towel or something like that and I'm going to put it back into that warm place in my oven, which is turned off, but just with the light on, and let it rest for about an hour and a half to two hours. And what I'm looking for is for it to really bubble up, and then we'll be ready to make our bread. Well, I had this in my oven for about two hours, and it's nice and foamy. I took an overhead picture, and I'll lay it over so that over the video so that you can see exactly what I'm talking about. But it looks very foamy in many ways, like a sourdough starter. And you're gonna, it's gonna have that real, like I said, <laughs> stinky cheese odor. But uh, you're on the right track. Well, now I only added the one cup of water uh, in the event thinking that I'm going to make one loaf of bread. But as I said, this isn't really an exact science. And so I've got two uh, bread pans prepared. And now what we're going to do is start adding some flour. And again, this is just plain all-purpose flour. It is organic, but it's just plain all-purpose flour. And I'm going to start adding it by the cup full and see how much we need to just kind of get a nice, wet, shaggy dough. Well, I added in three cups of flour and we've got it like a nice, wet, shaggy dough. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna flour my board generously. <laughs> and I'm just gonna rub this around. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna dump the dough out onto here and we're just gonna knead it as we incorporate some of this dough into it. Now, that said, in many ways, salt rise and bread, in a sense, is sort of the original no knead in a way, because you don't want to over knead this. Alrighty, we got this on our bowl, and we're done our bowl on our board, on our floured board, and we're just gonna work that flour into there, just folding it like this. Get that like that. Alrighty, let me get both hands into this now, and we're just gonna just work in some of this flour so that it's not too sticky. It's a wonderful dough to work with. You're gonna find it very soft. And just keep working that in. Got some on my fingers here. And we're just gonna keep working that in. That's coming along lovely. And as I said, we don't wanna over knead. Just fold, get it to where it's not too sticky. And then we'll get ready to shape it and put it into our loaf pan. Alrighty, now I think we're gonna get two loaves out of this. So I'm just gonna take my bench knife scraper and just cut this down the middle and then shape each of these into a loaf. And what I'm gonna do is, <laughs> get that separated, just again, put get some flour on it and sort of shape it into a nice loaf and keep the seam on the bottom. 
Now don't worry, this is, it is a very sticky dough, but I just wanna shape this nicely. And I've got that seam on the bottom, and then I'm gonna put it right down into my prepared pan. I've got that buttered, and that's all. And then I'm just gonna do the same with this other loaf, and I'm just gonna keep that seam down on the bottom. And I'm gonna go ahead and put that right in. <laughs> that one didn't come as neat. <laughs> now I'm gonna put these both back into my oven, the one that is just an electric oven with the light on, and it's averaging between 105 and 110 degrees. And I'll let these rise, it might take about two hours. Well, I wanted to take a minute and read something to you that I thought you would really appreciate. This is something that was said by Peter Reinhardt. And those of you who bake may be familiar with him. Uh, he's a relatively famous baker and author, and one of his books is The Bread Revolution. And this is what I wanna share with you that he said. I must admit that I have fallen under the spell of salt rising bread. Like an expensive white truffle, the earthly aroma and flavor are intoxicating. The more I eat, the more I want. Well, these salt risen breads have risen beautifully and took about two hours to get to this point. And now I'm gonna get ready to put them into a 400 degree Fahrenheit oven and they're going to bake for about 30 minutes. And something I wanna tell you so that you know you're on the right track when you do salt rising bread is that it's not going to dome. It's going to be flat like this. Well, look at these glorious salt rising breads. They were in the oven just about 30 minutes and they look beautiful. And I'm really glad, I wanna show you, I'm really glad that how they each look different. This one has a smooth top and this one has sort of a crack top. If it looks like this, you've done it right too. Uh, sometimes when they're rising, uh, it may just have a smooth top when it rises. Sometimes when it rises, it'll have like a crack top. It just is, you know, the, every, every, every bread, uh, every loaf of bread of salt rising bread that you make will look a little different, uh, but either way is perfect. Now I'm just gonna let these cool for a few minutes in the pan, but then we're gonna wanna get them out of the pan because we don't want them to get soggy on the sides. We're gonna get them out of the pan and then we're gonna let them cool completely before we cut into them. Well, I let this cool but I will confess, I haven't let it cool completely, <laughs> but I can't wait. So I'm just gonna uh, take a slice here. Oh, listen to that. Oh, it sounds wonderful. Let's see. Oh, look at this beautiful bread. Just glorious. Look at this glorious bread. I'm going to take a close-up picture and I'll overlay them so that you can see this magnificent crumb. Oh, and the aroma is wonderful. Now let's take a taste. Now what's interesting about this bread is it's a, it's a denser, like a country white uh, type bread, and it almost has like a cheesy aroma once it's baked and a cheesy taste. This bread is really delicious. You've got to give it a try. And it's so unique. It's just a lot of fun to make. I think my father-in-law would be very proud. And I think he's smiling down from heaven looking at this salt rising bread. Well, if you'd like to learn more about traditional cooking, be sure to subscribe to my channel and then click on this video over here where I show you how to make a sourdough starter, my foolproof sourdough starter from start to finish. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.